April 22nd, Srila Prabhupada is waiting to give his order. Now you become Acharya. You become authorized. This conversation deals squarely with this issue. The issue of becoming guru and the issue of disciplic succession after the departure of his divine grace. It is of great significance that this conversation took place just three weeks prior to Srila Prabhupada announcing that he would be leaving this world soon. Srila Prabhupada wouldn't have made that such an important decision all of a sudden. It would be reasonable to conclude that this decision to leave this world was something that he was very much on his mind for weeks and months prior to his announcement. It is also to be noted that this April 22nd conversation took place just five weeks before his last formal meeting with the GBC on May 28th, where the issue regarding initiations after he departs was brought up by the GBC and discussed with Srila Prabhupada directly in a formal meeting. It was just two and a half months before the July 9th Ridvik representative directive paper was dictated and signed by Srila Prabhupada. In this short conversation, I found a fountain containing many drops of ne nectar that per uh, are pertinent to grasping a good basis for understanding Srila Prabhupada's overall stand regarding future gurus. I will discuss those in detail after we hear the actual recording of the pertinent part of the conversation first. People complain against Hansuji. Did you know that? I'm, I'm not sure of the particular incidences, but I've heard general gentlemen. Gentlemen. The devotees there. How many Therefore, change is good. Some guru, but they must be qualified first. Oh, that kind of point was there. I I heard that. Yes. You are producing. Some drugs can do. Well, I've studied myself and all of your disciples, and I, it's clear fact that we're all conditioned souls, so we cannot be good. Maybe one day it may be possible, but mm. not now. Yes. I can do it. Now we do it. I can say, now we do not have it. We not I am waiting for you to become all at home. I retire completely. But the training must be complete. The process of purification. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Right. I don't know what Guru wants you. Now I have done Guru over here. Become Guru. But be qualified. Hmm. They can end strictly for us. Not rubber stamp. There is not be effect. You can cheat, but it will not be effect. See all gold you want, whatever you want. Want to put it on Guru. And in small temple and Guru. At that. No publication, no preaching, simply bring some food stuff. My Yuma is a giant mess. Place for eating. Our our attack. Giant mess. That 
word mess, by that he meant eating, messing, eating. Yeah. Room Conversation, April 22nd, 1977, in Bombay. As I said, there is a lot of nectar in this short conversation. There is a lot to analyze here. Significantly, Srila Prabhupada says, you become guru, but you must be qualified first of all. Then you become. What is the use of producing some rascal guru? I shall choose some guru. I shall say, now you become acharya. You become authorized. I am waiting for that. You become all acharya. But training must be complete. Become guru, but be qualified. It may be such a simple statement when Srila Prabhupada says, I shall say, now you become acharya, you become authorized. Then he adds, I am waiting for that. You become all acharya, I retire completely, but training must be complete. Actually, it is this statement that originally caught my attention and why I chose to start the chronological timeline with this date. It was afterwards that I found so many other wonderful drops of nectar given by Srila Prabhupada during this conversation that are important in regard to this issue. So what is so significant about this statement? Recall, as I mentioned earlier, that a number of times prior to this April 22nd, 1977 conversation, Srila Prabhupada had, had expressed his desire that his disciples would become gurus and make their own disciples all over the world. Many devotees, including in official GBC papers over the years, have held up those quotes as proof that Srila Prabhupada gave his permission and his order, his blessings for all of his disciples to become guru and make their own disciples. They hold up these quotes as proof that the path that GBC has taken is the one that Srila Prabhupada wanted us to follow. Others have pointed out that Srila Prabhupada instructed that one cannot become guru unless he has ordered by his guru. And the GBC and their supporters have held up the quotes were that Srila Prabhupada had previously given before April 22nd as just that, as Srila Prabhupada giving his order for us to become gurus. However, the true fact is that those previous instances were not the actual orders given by Srila Prabhupada. Rather, in those previous instances, his divine grace had been expressing his desire only. Yes, the spiritual master desires that all of his disciples would become fully qualified. All bona fide acharyas share this common desire. Srila Prabhupada many times expressed that desire. However, one has to be fully qualified first. This statement that Srila Prabhupada gave here on April 22nd, 1977, is vital in clarifying this point. <clears throat> here on April 22nd, 1977, just weeks before Srila Prabhupada announces that he'll be leaving this world soon, he states that he is still waiting to give that order. You become guru, but you must be qualified first of all, then you become. What is the use of producing some rascal guru? I shall choose some guru, I shall say, now you become acharya, you become authorized. I am waiting for that. You become all acharya, but training must be complete. Become guru, but be qualified. I am waiting for that. Since as of April 22nd, 1977, Srila Prabhupada clearly states that he is still waiting to give such an order to any of his disciples. This proves that the previous, the previous to this, he was simply expressing his desire. As of April 22nd, 1977, he had not yet given any such order to any of his disciples. And he explains that before he can give that order, that person must be actually qualified first. The very idea of authorizing men who are not qualified, Srila Prabhupada addresses this here when he asks, what is the use of producing rascal gurus? Those who would dare pose themselves as guru who have not fully completed their own training and are not fully qualified, Srila Prabhupada refers to them as rascal gurus. 
to be actually qualified. This is the most important criteria in becoming a bona fide guru. Before one's guru will authorize you to become an actual guru, you must be actually qualified first. To become bona fide guru, two things must be there. One, you must have completed your training and have become actually first class qualified. And two, your guru must give his direct and explicit order to you. You become guru. What we must understand from this conversation and the instructions, along with many others, is that the bona fide acharya holds the post of a bona fide guru to a very high standard. That is what protects and maintains the integrity, the purity, and the efficacy of the disciplic succession. The true acharya will not compromise on the very high and impeccable standards for becoming an authorized guru and our sampradaya. Yet most sadly, our current GBC totally lacks this understanding. Completely contrary to Srila Prabhupada's instructions, the current GBC argue that you don't have to be fully qualified to become a guru. In total opposition to Srila Prabhupada's teachings, they promote a system which does not demand that one has to complete their training first. They argue against this principle that Srila Prabhupada and the past acharyas demanded, that the post of guru must be held to such a high standard. The current GBC have complained that if they were to hold the post of guru to such a high standard that practically no one, none of them, would ever become guru in this lifetime. They argue that Srila Prabhupada's desire was that we all become guru and that that desire supersedes the need for the current desires to be fully qualified and pure. This is a farce. It is no less an insult to Srila Prabhupada and the entire disciplic succession. This is not at all what Srila Prabhupada taught. It is reprehensible. Let me give an analogy to help illustrate the importance of this understanding. Imagine a medical university who trains students as heart surgeons or brain surgeons. However, this university begins to hand out, hand out doctorate and medical degrees to students who have not completed their training. These students are, would now be called doctors, yet they would lack the needed qualifications to perform on that level of medical practice. Those doctors would botch one surgery after the next. That university would be a disgrace. The professors who hands out such degrees would be no less than a rascal and a cheater. He and the university, university would be legally culpable. The diplomas they hand out would be considered more worthless than the paper they were printed on. Rather than saving lives, these so-called doctors would be taking lives. The post of guru, the Vaishnava guru, is many times more crucial than that of a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon. The bona fide Vaishnava guru is a soul surgeon. If a brain surgeon makes a mistake, that person will lose that one life. If a soul surgeon gives the wrong guidance, that soul may be lost and lose the chance of getting out of this material world for millions and millions of lifetimes. Srila Prabhupada was not a disgraceful, shady, cheating, 10th class quack of a spiritual professor. He did not want his ISKCON mission would become such a shady and unscrupulous university that produces rascal gurus by awarding doctoral degrees in soul surgery to students who have not completed their training 100% and have become first class qualified to perform spiritual surgery on the conditioned souls of this world. What the GBC have done is a total disgrace. It is an insult 
to his divine grace, to ISKCON's founder Acharya, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. It is not in line with what Srila Prabhupada wanted or taught. Training must be complete. When would the Acharya be satisfied that the disciple has completed their training to become a bona fide Vaishnav soul surgeon, guru, in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Would it be the low standard that the current GBC promotes for becoming a guru today? Sadly, myself and a number of other disciples of Srila Prabhupada know that Srila Prabhupada would be furious to even suggest that he would accept the low standards that the GBC have adopted for becoming guru in his mission. Complete training means that one must come to the Paramahamsa on the ba Maha Bhagavat stage, the highest stage of pure devotion and God realization. In Chaitanya Charamrita Madhya Lila 24, 330, in his purport, Srila Prabhupada quotes from the Padma Purana and states, in the Padma Purana, the characteristics of the Guru, the bona fide spiritual master, have been described. Maha Bhagavata Shesto Brahmano Vai Guru Nanyam Sharvesham Eva Lokanam Asho Pujo Jatahari Mahakulo Purushotopi Sarva Jagneshu Dikshita Sahsara Sakadayaicha Na guru shyad avaishnavaha. The guru must be situated on the topmost platform of devotional service. Let me repeat. The guru must be situated on the topmost platform of devotional service. There are three classes of devotees, and the guru must be accepted from the topmost class. The first class devotee is the spiritual master for all kinds of people. It is said, Guru Nirnam. The word Nirnam means of all human beings. The Guru is not limited to a particular group. It is stated in the Upadeshamrita of Rupa Goswami that a Guru is a Goswami, a controller of the senses and the mind. Such a Guru can accept disciples from all over the world. Prithivim Sashishyat. This is the test of Guru. Here, both Shastra and Srila Prabhupada concur that the Guru must be situated on the platform of the topmost level of devotee. The Sanskrit term used in that verse is Maha Bhagavat. Maha Bhagavat means the topmost devotee. The three classes are Kanishta, Madhyama, and Uttama. Srila Prabhupada taught that one must only accept Guru from the Uttama, the topmost level. The verse is very clear. One must only accept a guru who is a Maha Bhagavat. There is no argument, no disagreement that Srila Prabhupada had wanted and desired that his disciples would become gurus. Just as the best professor of a reputable medical university would want to see that all his students who enrolled would become world-class top brain and heart surgeons, but not all who sign up will make it. Some will have to take up a lesser position in the medical profession simply because they were not able to complete the higher training of a Brahmin or heart surgeon. Some may not even make the medical profession, period. Just because the professor desires to see all his students graduate to the, to the highest level, a professor with actual integrity will not award the highest diploma whimsically to any student who has not completed their training completely. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati would have also wanted all his disciples to come to the topmost stage where they would all be qualified to make disciples all over the world. It would have been offensive to think that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati would not have wanted all his disciples to become guru. But the reality is, when it came time for Srila Bhakti Siddhanta to leave this world, he saw that not one single disciple had yet manifest their qualifications. That means that not even our own Srila Prabhupada had manifest his qualifications yet because uh, at that time, because Srila Prabhupada told us that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta saw that no one was yet qualified. 
So what did Shilabhakta Siddhanta do when it was time for him to leave, but he saw that no one, not one of his disciples was yet qualified? Shila Prabhupada said he selected no one to act as guru. That exemplifies the strict integrity that a genuine acharya holds. He will not, under any circumstance, compromise on this point. Before he could recommend anyone to become a bona fide guru, that person must, must have reached the Mahabhagavat stage, period. He must have at least uh, manifest that he had reached that stage. No exceptions, no compromises. It isn't that because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati wanted all his disciples to rise to that level of guru, that before he departed, he ordered all his disciples to become guru, whether they were qualified or not. No, since no one had yet manifest the full qualifications, he selected no one. Even though this would mean that for decades, the world would no longer have a bona fide guru. The standard that a genuine guru follows is that it is far better that there are, there be no guru at all then there'd be hundreds of unfit and unqualified rascal gurus. In this letter on the screen to Rupanuga Prabhu, Srila Prabhupada writes, speaking of his guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati, I'm quoting excerpts from the letter, he, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, never recommended anyone to be acharya of the Gaudiya Math. But Sridhar Maharaj is responsible for disobeying this order of Guru Maharaj. And he and others who are already dead unnecessarily thought that there must be one Acharya. If Guru Maharaj would have seen someone who was qualified at that time to be Acharya, he would have mentioned. Because on the night before he passed away, he talked of so many things, but never mentioned an Acharya. His idea was Acharya was not to be nominated amongst the governing body. This is a letter to Rupanuga Prabhu, uh, written on April 28, 1974. Srila Prabhupada's point on April 22nd was that one must be fully qualified first. This is the standard followed by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati and our Guru Maharaj, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder and acharya of Iskand. Only a Maha Bhagavat is accepted by Shastra to be completely qualified to be Guru. Here in April of 1977, we learn that Hamsadutta Swami had made an attempt to initiate some new members of Iskand as his own dis direct disciples. At the time, Hamsadutta was a leading disciple of Srila Prabhupada. I'm not sure what date he joined, but I know that by 1968, he was already a temple president. Iskand had only been founded in 1966. In 1970, he was one of the original 12 men that Srila Prabhupada had appointed to the original GBC. By 1977, he had long been an avid preacher. By his preaching, he had opened centers and made many devotees all over the world. He was a most senior disciple, a respected sannyasi. Srila Prabhupada had even appointed him lifelong trustee of the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, the BBT. All, of all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples at that time, he was definitely one of the most qualified. Yet in 1977, when Hamsadutta made an attempt to take his own disciples, Srila Prabhupada directly infers that Hamsadutta's training was not yet complete. And keep in mind, this was only two and a half months before the July 9th appointment letter where Srila Prabhupada had appointed him one of the Ritvik representatives. You can become guru, but you must be qualified first class. What is the use of producing some rascal guru? Even though Hamsadutta was one of the most advanced preaching sannyasi GBC disciples of Srila Prabhupada at that time, Srila Prabhupada considered he was not yet qualified to become initiating guru. Rather, Srila Prabhupada referred to him as becoming a rascal guru if he had taken his own disciples. This was just three weeks before his divine grace announced that he would be leaving this world soon. Many of the so-called gurus in ISKCON 
today don't even meet the qualification Hamsa Duda had at that time. Not that you have to be a GBC or a lifelong BBT trustee or even a sannyasi to be a guru, but the fact remains that Hamsa Duda was one of the more advanced preaching disciples at the time. And yet in Srila Prabhupada's assessment, he had not completed his training yet. He had not reached the Uttama stage. What is disturbing for myself and many others is that from this high standard that Srila Prabhupada held for the position of Guru, the GBC are now promoting a wide open door policy that as long as you hold the minimum standard of being Srila Prabhupada's disciple in good standing, you can become a Guru in ISKCON. From Krishna.com, at least as of December of 2020, the website states, and I quote, in ISKCON, any disciple of Srila Prabhupada in good standing can become a guru. That is those who are steady in their vows to chant 16 rounds, 1,728 times, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra daily, and refrain from illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and gambling. Recommendations from responsible leaders are also required. To become recognized as a spiritual master in ISKCON, one currently has to be authorized by the GBC, Governing Body Commission, which is the highest managerial authority in ISKCON. End of quote. This is a total farce. It is a grave offense and a disservice to Srila Prabhupada. The GBC's low standard for guru is one has to only follow the basic qualifications for becoming a disciple of His Divine Grace. Just the basic disciple who follows the minimum requirements, and that is all. That is pathetic. At least in 1969, Srila Prabhupada had stated that one must pass the Bhaktivedanta exam. But the GBC don't even require that, not listed on their their official website at all. The GBC have brought the high standard of guru down to their own low class level rather than raising themselves up to the Mahabhagavat standard that Srila Prabhupada insisted on and Shastra insists on. <clears throat> In Srila Prabhupada's words, what is the use of producing some rascal guru? You can become guru, but you must be qualified first class. not rubber stamp. There will not be a You can cheat, but it will not be a Prabhupada. Prabhupada, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants that. Amara Agnaya Guruhana. Become Guru, but be qualified first. Little things strictly follow. Tamal Krishna, not rubber stamped? Prabhupada, then you'll not be effective. You can cheat, but it will not be effective. <clears throat> Here is another drop of nectar in this conversation. Tamal Krishna makes a reference that the guru should not be rubber stamped. Srila Prabhupada had used this term many times for various other topics. For example, he used, to, used it in reference to Gandhi, labeling the lowest class of people as Hari John. The word Hari John was previously reserved for res respected Vaishnavas, you know, advanced Vaishnavas. But Gandhi wanted to artificially make everyone equal as far as like in spiritual advancement is concerned. So he rubber stamped the low class, meat eating, wine drinking, ganja smoking, beady, uh, beady smoking street sweepers as Hari John. Prabhupada's point is that a true Harijan requires real qualifications. 
It requires training and understanding of scripture. One must be a Brahmin. It requires one to be self-realized and truly knowing and loving and serving Lord Hari. You can't make someone a genuine Harijan just by taking a rubber stamp and stamping a label on a very low-class person calling that low-class fool Harijan doesn't make that person a real Harijan, a man of God. Same with being an actual Brahmin. In this age, everyone is born Shudra. Anyone can become an actual Brahmin, but to become a genuine Brahmin requires training and study. One has to live by the principles of a Brahmin. Then one can be known as Brahmin. But to take a rubber stamp and label any nonsense fool and rascal as a Brahmin does not make that person a Brahmin. In regards to rubber stamping gurus, this means that for a a group like the GBC to take this label um, and, and label you an ISKCON guru, that does not make you an actual guru. This is directly addressed here when Tamal Krishna says, not rubber stamped. Guru is not made by a process of rubber stamping. Shiluk Prabhupada called this an ineffective cheating process. While writing about his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati, Srila Prabhupada wrote, His idea was Acharya was not to be nominated amongst the governing body. That letter from Rupa Nuga, April 28, 1974. This was Srila Bhakti instruction, and Srila Prabhupada repeated it. He never gave a rescinding order. Gurus or Acharyas are not to be nominated by the GBC. That instruction stands. But in their lust to become Gurus, the GBC have thrown Srila Prabhupada's and Bhakti Siddhanta's words away in the dust. They have pompously authorized themselves to rubber stamp or ordain gurus. What many members of ISKCON don't realize is that when devotees who uphold the Ritvik Ras path and who declare that the GBC system is not the system Srila Prabhupada wanted, what many don't understand when we call their system a cheating and non-effective system and refer to the current gurus as rubber stamp gurus, as rascal gurus, all of this is not some off-the-wall, poisonous, nonsense concocted idea. These are the very words and descriptions that Srila Prabhupada himself spoke regarding the current system in ISKCON. It is Srila Prabhupada who restated Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's order that the GBC is not to ordain new gurus. It is Srila Prabhupada who referred to such a process of being ineffective and cheating. It is Srila Prabhupada who said that those who pose as gurus but are not fully qualified, he has called them rascal gurus. All of this describes the current process the GBC follows today. Srila Prabhupada then went on to call those temples where such rubber stamp gurus live as being a joint mess. <laughs> This was a term that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had used. If you aren't familiar with this term, see the sidebar explanation. Meaning of joint mess. For those unfamiliar with this term, it is currently mostly a military term. The mess hall, it's generally the eating hall. But officers in the military have what is called the joint officer's mess or as Srila Prabhupada called it, the joint mess. This is a place where the officers socialize, eat, and they sometimes bunk up or live there also. The origin of the word mess comes from Old French, mess, meaning a portion or measurement of food. You put a mess on one's plate to eat. Hundreds of years ago in England, the room where you ate food became known as the mess hall. I don't know, but it would appear that at some point in time, there must have been mess halls where people were just really sloppy when they ate and or the mess halls were not clean very well. Well, somehow the word mess began to be used for something that was unclean or messy. But in the military, the word mess hall still refers to a place where you eat. And in the officer's joint mess, is a place where the officers eat, socialize, and often live also. 
Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta used that term in that way. <clears throat> As we will show in the course of the presentation, it was the GBC, not Srila Prabhupada, who declared that the 11 Ritviks would have become gurus. The GBC misunderstood what Srila Prabhupada was saying on May 28th. They thought he had said that they were to become gurus, but that is not what he said. They were wrong. Srila Prabhupada never gave them an order to become guru. He never authorized them to become gurus. The GBC are the ones who declared the 11 Ritviks were to become gurus. And ever since then, the GBC have ordained and rubber stamped so many other what Srila Prabhupada himself called non-effective, cheating, rascal gurus. No professor who has an ounce or even a nanogram of integrity would instruct students who themselves have not yet completed their own training for them to be awarding diplomas of the highest medical standards to themselves and to others who had also not completed their training. It is a total farce. The sincere followers of Srila Prabhupada must stand up to this current GBC and demand that they follow the instructions, the teachings, and the standards that Srila Prabhupada set in this regard. To assume that Srila Prabhupada was nothing but an unscrupulous spiritual professor who authorized students who had not completed their training to award themselves the highest degrees and then turn around and offer those degrees to others who are also not fully trained or qualified, it is a direct offense and an insult to his divine grace. It is absurd. But what about those letters back in 1969 that Srila Prabhupada sent to Kirtanananda and Hamsadutta? where he stated that not only they, but all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples by 1975 who had passed the Bhaktivedanta exam can initiate disciples. What happened to that idea? Well, he made those statements in those two letters back in January of 1969. He never mentioned this again in, regard, in regards to those exams. And obviously, when 1975 rolled around, Srila Prabhupada never authorized anyone to initiate their own disciples in that year. So what happened? I will offer my own view or opinion on this and give some supporting, give supporting evidence why I take the stand. Srila Prabhupada had formed ISKCON in the summer of 1966. Years later, in January of 1969, ISKCON was still quite small. There were only a handful of temples and Srila Prabhupada's disciples were just in the hundreds. Yet many of those early devotees had the most fortunate blessings of having Srila Prabhupada's direct and personal association. Srila Prabhupada directly and personally taught many of them how to chant, how to preach, how to offer puja, how to clean, how to cook, how to bathe even, even you know, how to do kirtan, everything. They learned directly from Srila Prabhupada and his direct association. Srila Prabhupada's spiritual potency was like the blazing fire, and they were like the cold iron rods. Due to the direct association with His divine grace, their spiritual lives glowed red hot. But most of that hot glow wasn't due to their own realizations and advancement. Most of it was coming from their close contact and association with Srila Prabhupada. In 1969, into January of 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 1968, and into January of 1969, Srila Prabhupada saw how red hot those new devotees had become in just a short time. And he was certain in just a few more years, at least in six years, by 1975, they would all become Mahabhagavats at that rate that they were going, and they could then could, you know, initiate their own disciples. But starting in 1969, the Hare Krishna movement had an explosion of growth. Soon, Srila Prabhupada would be constantly traveling around the world as more and more centers were being opened. Those early devotees who were glowing red hot and the purity of devotion while in Srila Prabhupada's direct association, when he could be gone for now, extended period of times, their red hot glow began to cool down to just warm. 
As Srila Prabhupada traveled more and more, he saw that much of what had appeared to be their quick advancement was really due to being in his association, close association, and he soon understood that. While his disciples were making advancement, they weren't as advanced as he originally thought they were on their own, and that it would take much longer for them to become fully trained. I also personally saw a number of times how some of the senior men took on a very humble and advanced mood in the company of Srila Prabhupada. But outside of his company, they displayed very little Vaishnav humility or advancement. <clears throat> in 1970, Srila Prabhupada formed the GBC. Just months later, he had to disband the first GBC effort because the GBC men committed offenses and were not as competent and as pure as they had appeared to be. Later, he, be, he again reinstated the GBC. He restarted it, but it became evident that his disciples, although they were exhibiting much utsahan, great enthusiasm, they had a long way to go before they could actually reach the topmost stage of devotional life and become actually qualified, become gurus. Thus, he no longer spoke or wrote about those who passed the Bhaktivedanta exam as being authorized to initiate disciples. When 1975 came, he didn't authorize a single devotee to become a guru. He did, however, continue to express his desire that his disciples would one day become so qualified, but he took no action in 1975 to authorize even one disciple, what to speak of all of his early disciples. And here in April of 1977, two years after 1975, Hamsa Duda made an attempt to take his own direct disciples. Yet many saw this as, as while well, many saw this as wrong, in Hamsa Duda's defense, Srila Prabhupada had written that letter to him in 1960. Yet in April of 1977, two years after 1975, Hamsa Duda made an attempt to take his own direct disciples. Yet many saw this as, as while many saw this as wrong, in Hamsa Duda's defense, Srila Prabhupada had written that letter to him in 1969, where Srila Prabhupada had told him that in a few years, he should be able to initiate his own disciples. And by night, Srila Prabhupada had written that letter to disciples. Here in April of 1970, but he took no action in 1975 to authorize even one disciple, what to speak of all of his early disciples. And here in April of 1977, two years after 1975, Hamsa Duda made an attempt to take his own direct disciples. Yet many saw this as, as while many saw this as wrong, in Hamsa Duda's defense, Srila Prabhupada had written that letter to him in 1969, where Srila Prabhupada had told him that in a few years, he should be able to initiate his own disciples. And by 1975, all of Prabhupada's disciples should be able to initiate. So Hamsa Duda wasn't acting totally without any prior preliminary indication that he might be able to do so. However, even though it was 1977, however, even though it was 1977, well past the 1975 date, Srila Prabhupada directly informed Hamsa Duda that he was not yet complete with his training that he wasn't fully qualified to become actual guru. And for him to pose himself when he, was, he had not become fully qualified, he would be no more than just a rascal guru. This is quite a far cry from what Srila Prabhupada had stated in 1969, what his desire was back then. Even though in 1969 he had told Hamsa Duda that in a few years he, he, he would hold Bhaktivedanta exams and that those who passed would be able to initiate, those plans obviously changed because his disciples had not advanced as much as or as quickly as he originally anticipated. By 1977, Srila Prabhupada clearly called out Hamsa Duda as not being yet qualified or not having completed his training. And it wasn't just Hamsa Duda. Note, to see another example of Prabhupada considering the devotees in the late 1960s to be more advanced at that time than they were later in 1975, tap on the sidebar.
Okay, I'm going to tell my own personal story about, uh, to give an example of how devotees in the late 1960s were actually more advanced, the same devotees, with many of them, than they were in 1975. In the summer of 1970, I got one of the very first Krishna books, and most likely it was the very first Krishna book to be distributed. That is a long story all on, all on its own. And I made a one and a half plus hour video of that story. I made it in the summer of, of 2020, which marked 50 years since the time I got that Krishna book. If you want, or when you have time, you can click on that link, or then you can save it for later and watch it later. When I got that Krishna book, I was really blown over by all the full color paintings. I had long been searching for a book that would describe what God looked like and what his activities were in the spiritual kingdom. And this book not only gave such descriptions in detail, but it contained what Srila Prabhupada called windows to the spiritual world. These were the full color paintings depicting Krishna and his pastimes. Out of all these paintings, I later found out that m most of the ones that I liked the best were painted by the one and same artist. Her name was Mother Devahuti Devi Dasi. Yeah, I'm slipping this in here. I, um, this is from my video that I found, and it was taken in Los Angeles. And um, it's the only pictures that I could find of Devahuti. I just came across it, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just put it up. Uh, this is Devahuti Devi Dasi. And um, it's only like one second, two seconds in the video. Um, but like I said, when, in, in 1974, when she became my art guru, my, uh, my uh, uh, you know, she taught me some things. In the, uh, so anyway, she was, uh, she was Mataji. I mean, not Mataji, she was Grand Mataji. I was 23. And this is, you know, how old she was at the time. I'm not good at judging age. I, I don't want to, you know, maybe she was in her 50s, but I would think she was in her 60s at the time. Um, all gray hair and all. But uh, those are the only pictures that I uh, readily can find of her. I've searched the internet. Um, and I just happened to have had this video a long time ago. I downloaded it, so. Um, and then I saw she was on there just a few seconds. Her name was Mother Devahuti Devi Dasi. She had painted the Rasa dance. Now, I'll, I'll, let me just explain about the Rasa dance, the painting in the Krishna book. There's, I don't, I think it's a fault of the color separations. The colors don't pop. They don't, and I've uh, popped them a little bit on, uh, you know, like uh, with the, with the uh, a, a photo editor, but uh, <clears throat> so that looked more like the original painting. But the paintings in the Krishna book just didn't pop, but I love that painting. I was blown away. It was in Srila Prabhupada's room in Los Angeles where that painting hangs above his bed in his room, his personal quarters in Los Angeles. And when I first saw the actual painting, I was like, oh, wow. And no wonder Prabhupada hung it above his bed in his room. Uh, the other paintings that I really liked, and that was painted by Devahuti, Mother Devahuti Devi Dasi, was Krishna stealing the clothes of the gopis. Um, the Makan Chorda, the, the butter thief, uh, Krishna entering Mathura and giving the, the uh, flower garland by the Walla. When I got the Krishna book, I also got, at the same time at the library, the Nectar of Devotion and the teachings of Lord Chaitanya all at the same time. And, uh, you know, you'll have to click on that story of that video for the, all the details. But another painting I really liked was on the cover of the original Nectar of Devotion. Radha Krishna on the swing. That was also painted by Devahuti Devi Dasi. It was a copy of the, uh, it was, she made a copy of the original painting that was done in the 1920s or 30s by, I think his name was Banerjee. And Srila Prabhupada very much liked that Banerjee's paintings. And it was one of his favorites when Srila Prabhupada was a young man. I had seen Indian prints before. You know, Indian prints like the Krishna standing, the, the gopi, I mean, the, the milk, uh, the, the makan chorda. But the paintings, and I'd seen the Indian prints before, but the paintings in Srila Prabhupada's books, they were just different. 
I could feel real spiritual potency, real spiritual purity, real energy coming from just seeing the prints um, and the, uh, of those paintings in the, in the Krishna book. They were on the spiritual platform. I could feel that. And I, there was so much energy coming from those paintings that I considered the artists who painted those paintings to be very spiritually advanced souls. So in 1970, when I got that Krishna book, I prayed to Krishna that someday he would allow me to meet the artist who painted those paintings. However, when I got those, the, the books back in 1970, I didn't know about temples. It took me three years to finally join ISKCON. Those three years are not explained in that video uh, about how I got the Krishna book, but I will make another video on how I came to Krishna consciousness and what happened in those three years. When I do, I'll complete it. And when I get it completed, I'll put a link up here for that as well. But I joined the temple in 1973. Some months later, I saw a letter to Srila Prabhupada requested artists to come to Mayapur to help him you know, making the temple there and the, making the temple project in, in Mayapur Dham. Art was a hobby of mine before I became a devotee. So I asked Karander, my GBC at the time, if I could go to India. I wanted to go to India to be help with the art. He tried to talk me out of it, but I insisted to go. So he and Jayatirtha, who was my temple president, and then a few months later became the GBC in Los Angeles, decided I would have to earn my ticket to go by working at the BBT warehouse, shipping out orders for six months, and then they would send me. This was before the BBT artist had moved to LA. The BBT artists at the time were in New York, at the, uh, the Yiscon Press in New York. But since I had made it known that I wanted to do artwork, a devotee in Los Angeles, who was in charge of the new LA art department, Naranarayan Prabhu, uh, engaged me in one art project. Uh, I'll explain it quickly, but for more details on this, I'll make another video about this because it is a story uh, I, I tell about Prabhupada and experience I had. But I'm, uh, he, Prabhupada was coming um, to, the, uh, to the LA temple and, and he had his garden in the, he would, go out and have darshans in his garden, give darshans, and there was no, the seat they were reading to the Prabhupada experience I had. But I'm, uh, he, Prabhupada was coming um, to, the, uh, to the LA temple and, and he had his garden in the, he would go out and have darshans in his garden, give darshans, and there was no, the seat they were redoing it. And a devotee was making a little asan for it out in this garden, but he hadn't completed it yet. So they made this white box, just a, I don't know, four foot, three by four foot or something, and a couple foot high and painted it all white. And Narayan came up to me and said, you want to be an artist? Here, paint something artistic on it. And he said, here's your project. And he said, but Prabhupada's coming. It has to be done quickly. So <clears throat> I had to go and buy acrylic paint so they dry instantly. And, what to paint. Anyway, I came up and I knew you couldn't paint the Hare Krishna mantra. I knew I couldn't paint Krishna. Prabhupada wouldn't sit on top of Krishna. He won't sit on top of his holy name. That's Krishna. So what am I going to paint? And I don't know why I came up with a cow. And I painted a cow with flowers around. And on the top of it, I painted a, um, a mandal of a lotus. Not an actual look like a lotus, but a mandal. And I got it from I had gotten that from books that I had gotten in the library before I became a devotee. So I knew it was a bona fide design, but I, and I painted it on there. But Narayan, when I was done with it, Narayan, Narayan looked at the top of it and he said, what is that? I said, it's a lotus flower. Said, that is no lotus flower. And I said, well, it's not an actual lotus flower. It's a lotus mandal. And he said, oh, that is, can't have Prabhupada see that. So he told a devotee, go get, a, get something, cover this. And, and the devotee ran to his apartment and brought a, a uh, Islam prayer rug that he had on his wall. And they put that on top. And Prabhupada's, uh, so Prabhupada came out in the garden. And I didn't get to go to the garden. Um, but uh, I was a new devotee. So <clears throat> Prabhupada came out to the garden. And, and he looked at the cow and he was smiling. Narayan told me the story later. He was smiling at it and looking and kept looking at it, and then he went to sit down. Just before he sat down, he lifted up the blanket to see what was underneath the prayer rug. 
And Narayan was going, oh no, you know, Prabhupada, what's he going to say? You know, he's not going to, what is this and all that. And he said, Prabhupada looked at it and he smiled, put it down and he got up on the, sat down and he lifted up his knee and he lifted up the rug again. He looked at it and he put it down. Who has painted this? And Narayan said, oh, his new disciple, Srila Prabhupada, you just initiated him, Amayatma Das. And Prabhupada said, oh, tell him he has done very nicely. So after that um, meeting, then Narayan came running up to tell me what had happened. So I call that, you know, receiving Prabhupada's uh, mercy in his garden, and uh, receiving mercy in Prabhupada's garden. Even though I wasn't in the garden, I got his mercy. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, the very first New York BBT artist, so there was a devotee, I think she was initiated in Los Angeles. Um, I'm not positive, but I think that's where I saw in the disciples list. So Deva Hudi Devi Dasi. So she had gone to New York to with the uh, ISKCON Press was there and became an artist and they and she did all the paintings for the Krishna book and did I mean did the paintings that she had done for the Krishna book there in New York. But she had come back to Los Angeles. So she was one of the first New York BBT artists to come back to LA or to come to LA. And the plan was that since the BBT was setting up in Los Angeles, that the BBT art department, the ISKCON Press art department, w along with all the artists, would then move from New York to Los Angeles. So Narayan thought that rather than me going to India to do artwork in Mayapur, that I should stay in Los Angeles and train to start painting for uh, the, the BBT and start painting for Srila Prabhupada's books. And since Devahuti was the f uh, first of the BBT artists to be there at the time, he asked her to spend some time with me and get me started, uh, uh, you know, and, and training for the painting for the books. And Devahuti Devi Dasi wasn't just Mataji. She was more the age of my grandmother. As a brahmachari, I was very strict and I, I didn't talk unnecessarily with, with women at the time. But Devahuti was different. Because of her being, because of her age and being like grandmother, and, and but mostly because she only spoke about Srila Prabhupada. And she just shared these wonderful nectarian stories with me. I felt very blessed to be in her association. So I asked her what painting she had painted and was so surprised to find out that she painted nearly all of my favorite paintings from the Krishna book and on the cover of the original Nectar Devotion. I had prayed to Krishna to gain the artist association who had painted those paintings, and Krishna answered those prayers. Several of her paintings hung in Srila Prabhupada's personal quarters at the time, at the, in Los Angeles. Uh, <clears throat> and at the time, that painting from the cover of the Nectar Devotion, Nectar Devotion was in Srila Prabhupada's sitting room. Srila Prabhupada also very much liked her paintings. As I was training to paint for the books, soon all the other BBT artists came from New York to LA, Jadarani, Parikshit, Murlidhar. So I wound up getting all their association. And later Bardraj came, and I wound up joining him, under him, uh, on the Fate Multimedia Museum Project. In 1975, maybe late 1974, but I'm sure it was in 1975, now that the BBT artists had moved to Los Angeles, and since Rameshwar is managing the BBT, uh, the art department now came under his guidance. He wanted to standardize the style of the BBT paintings so that all of the paintings would have the same style. For his project, he wanted to have the artist redo all of the Krishna book paintings in this new style for the next printing of the Krishna book. So to start with, he had a number of the artist but not Devahuti Devi Dasi, but the other artist for the next printing of the Krishna book. So to start with, he had a number of the artist, but not Devahuti Devi Dasi, but the other artist, they all worked together on a new Rasa dance painting. This painting was to set the standard for the new BBT style of art. Rameshwar was so happy with what they had done. So when Srila Prabhupada came, Rameshwar took the painting up to Srila Prabhupada's room 
and he decided to do an official unveiling of the painting. <clears throat> he brought the painting up draped in a cloth. He had an easel brought up and, and before he unveiled the painting, he made a presentation, presentation to Srila Prabhupada. He explained how this painting was designed to be, it was going to set the new style for the BBT paintings. He explained how so many of the artists had worked together on this painting and how he planned to replace all of the paintings in the Krishna book with these new paintings in this new style. After building up this, the great expectations for this painting, he finally unveiled the painting and looked towards Srila Prabhupada, anticipating his beaming smile of approval. Instead, Srila Prabhupada turned up his nose and said, this is not rasa dance, this is hippie dance. <clears throat> he let Rameshwar know in no uncertain terms that he flatly did not approve of this new style and this new painting in particular. He told Rameshwar, do not publish this painting in any of my books. Oops. Uh, well, that was the next part of Rameshwar's presentation, which he had to now go ahead and go ahead with it. And that was to show Srila Prabhupada the latest volume from the Srimad Bhagavatam that had just come out from the printers. And yes, that painting was in that volume. Srila Prabhupada was not at all happy. He told Rameshwar to immediately order a new printing of that copy of the, of the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, of that edition without this painting. So much he detested that new style that, and that painting in particular. In particular. Then he instructed Rameshwar that he must not remove any of the original Krishna book paintings. He said, you can add new ones, but do not remove any of the original ones. Srila Prabhupada said, <clears throat> I'm quoting from what Rameshwar had told me, when he came out of that meeting, uh, Srila Prabhupada said the original paintings, because Rameshwar had to explain all of this to the artist and uh, what had happened anyway, he said that Srila Prabhupada said the original paintings of that Krishna book were painted with pure love and devotion. These new paintings are not. I have the eyes to see, but you do not. So he told that those original paintings were painted with real, pure love and devotion. And most of those were painted in 1969. The Krishna book was published in the spring of 1970. And it came back from the printers in the summer of 1970, which is when I got it in the library. Uh, but with the exception of Devahuti Devidasi, the artist who worked on that new style painting in 1975, they were the same artist who painted the original Krishna book paintings in 1969. Uh, Yet in 1969, Srila Prabhupada considered that their services, their paintings, were done in pure loving devotion back in 1969. And yet six years later, those same devotee artists, he considered their later paintings lacked such pure devotion. I know it's a rather long detailed story, Oh, and there's more I want to share about Devahuti Devi Dasi and glorification of her pure devotion and why she wasn't part of that new style. But that will have to be in another ancillary note or another video. And when I have that one done, I will put it up and put up the link here so you can click on it. But this long story was to give an example that supports my view that in 1969, when Srila Prabhupada had written those letters that by 1975, he anticipated all his earlier disciples would become qualified to give initiation. This was due to the fact that in 1969, those early devotees were exhibiting red hot devotion. And due to, Shil but it was due to Srila Prabhupada's close association that they had rapidly exhibited such advanced purity, such that Srila Prabhupada anticipated in just another six years, they will all become Mahabhagavats. But in the following years, this changed. In 1968, and before those earlier devotees 
They, had, they were enjoying that rare direct and close association with the pure devotee. And thus they exhibited a higher level of purity also, like the iron rod that glows just like fire in the association of fire. But once Prabhupada began traveling more and more, and those devotees were no longer in his direct association, their iron of devotion no longer glowed as red hot as it had in 1969. And <clears throat> as long as they stayed on course, they would advance, but it was going to take a lot longer. The road was going to be a lot longer journey than just a few years to become fully qualified. That is the purpose of me telling the story to show how this was the case for the artist. And it was also the case for the earlier devotees who had so much of Srila Prabhupada's close personal association. Another point we learn from this short conversation held on April 22nd, 1977, is found actually in something Tamal Krishna says and Srila Prabhupada's reaction, or lack thereof, to it. Well, I've studied myself and all of your disciples, and I, it's clear fact that we're all conditioned souls, so we cannot be glued. Maybe one day it may be possible, but mm. not now. Yes. I can do it. Now we do it. I can say it. Now we do not have it. We do not have it. I am waiting for it. You become all I can. I retire completely. But the train must be complete. Tamal Krishna tells Srila Prabhupada that he has studied himself and all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples. And he claims that he and they, all of Prabhupada's disciples, are actually conditioned souls and they cannot become guru, not yet anyway. Note, and this is important, that Srila Prabhupada doesn't object to that assessment. If Srila Prabhupada felt that Tamal Krishna or any of his other disciples were actually qualified to be guru, he would have strongly objected. Obviously, this was not at all Srila Prabhupada's response. Srila Prabhupada actually agreed with this harsh assessment. It must be pointed out what Tamal is actually telling his own Guru Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada, what Tamal is really saying directly to Srila Prabhupada's face is that, and I, I, I quote, but this is just a, para, I mean, a para, rephrasing of it. Srila Prabhupada, I have studied all of your disciples, and despite so many years of them trying to follow your instructions and chanting the Maha Mantra and rendering, you know, so much devotion and service all these years, I have studied myself and all of your disciples, Srila Prabhupada, and we are still just conditioned souls and not a single one of us, not, not one of your disciples is yet qualified to be guru. This is what Tamal Krishna was really telling Srila Prabhupada to his face. If Srila Prabhupada had disagreed in the slightest to that very scathing assessment, please understand that he would have made his disagreement loud and clear. If Srila Prabhupada had considered that even one of his disciples had advanced beyond being just a conditioned soul, if even one disciple had become truly qualified to become an actual guru by April of 1977, Srila Prabhupada would have defended the honor of that Vaishnav by forcefully chastising this assessment made by Tamal Krishna. He would have declared Tamal's assessment to be offensive both to him as the guru and to those disciples who were qualified. But that was not the response the Srila Prabhupada gave. Rather than disagreeing with this assessment that not one of his disciples were yet qualified to become guru, Srila Prabhupada instead says, yes. And he explains that he is still waiting to give his order for someone to become guru. He is still waiting because their training must be complete first. So it wasn't just Hamsadura who Srila Prabhupada singled out as not yet having completed his training and it was not yet qualified to become a guru in April of 1977. 
Shiva Prabhupada agreed with Tamala's assessment that not one single disciple was yet qualified to become guru, not as of April 22nd, 1977. This was just days before Shiva Prabhupada announced he was going to leave this world soon, just weeks before the May 28th meeting, and just two and a half months before the July 9th letter. His divine grace agreed that not one single of, of his disciples was yet qualified to be actual guru. Then, what if? What if no one completes their training and becomes qualified, before, fully qualified, before Srila Prabhupada departs? Then what? What we know is that when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati departed and he saw that no one was yet qualified, he chose to select no one. He instructed that the next Acharya will become self-evident at some point. In the same way, our Srila Prabhupada was under no obligation that he had to select someone, even if they aren't qualified yet, before he departs. Rather, the real obligation was to not select anyone who was not fully qualified. That is the true obligation. Since he could not select anyone himself because no one was yet qualified, does it make any sense at all that he would then leave it up to the GBC, who themselves had not completed their training, for them to start ordaining some of themselves and others as gurus? when Srila Prabhupada himself could not select anyone because no one was yet qualified. Does it make any sense that he would then do that, leave it up to the GBC who themselves weren't qualified, and then they will select? When we understand what Srila Prabhupada actually taught, what he said here just days before he announced that he was departing, and what the real standards are that a bona fide acharya upholds as the actual standard for the succeeding gurus, then we can see just how much of a farce the GB system has been. The most pressing obligation of a genuine acharya was to see that his mission will not create useless, rascal, cheating gurus. His obligation is to protect the highest integrity of the disciplic line. And if need be, wait until such disciples become actually qualified first. Even if that means no one will become a successor guru for many decades, as in the case with when Bhakti Siddhanta left, or even for another 10,000 years to, to follow if it needs be. Srila Prabhupada's most important obligation is to preserve the purity, the integrity of the disciplic succession. The current GBC have failed to understand this. They have failed to properly uphold this standard. The sincere and intelligent members of the GBC need to now grasp this understanding and make the needing changes to again uphold the standards and teachings that Srila Prabhupada taught.